really grateful that I had the opportunity to, to travel to some sacred places, places that have been sacred for um, other people and that I found were sacred. And um, so I, I was able to really ponder what, what makes these places special and what, um, what is it that creates holy ground for us. Uh, so one of the places that I visited, let's see if I can get it, is New Kamaldoli Kamold New Kamaldoli Hermitage in Big Sur. It's on the Big Sur coast, and it's a Benedictine monastery. So this is up way up above the monastery, looking down. You can see that it is very steeply perched on a hillside above Big Sur, above the above the ocean, and. Um, it, it, you kind of have to white knuckle it on the way up because you're uh, doing switchbacks going up a mountain on a basically a one lane road with no guardrail. Um, so, but a beautiful setting. And the monks at New Kamaldoli practice Benedictine hospitality. They, they provide space for uh, spiritual seekers who want to practice silence and prayer in a really simple but beautiful setting. And so I had my own little cabin on the side of the hill. Uh, that's the name of it, Hezekiah, which is a Greek word that means solitude. And there's the view. Uh, so for three days, I had um, silence, a really nice view, um, simple but tasty meals. I uh, hiked the streams along Big Sur Coast as I was prepping for a big hiking trip I was taking. And I worshipped with the monks um, three times a day in their, in their simple but beautiful chapel as they chanted the Liturgy of the Hours. It was definitely a sacred place for me. And the third place I visited, I know this may bother you, it bothers me, I'm taking them out of order. Um, the third place I visited was Holden Village in the uh, Cascade Mountains of Eastern Washington State. And getting to Holden is definitely a pilgrimage because it took several modes of different types of transportation for me to get there. I had to take a plane to Spokane, rent a car, and drive three and a half hours to Lake Chelan and then get on a ferry uh, for a two and a half hour sail up Lake Chelan. And then got on the old yellow school bus named Honey. All of the vehicles in Holden Village have names. Uh, Honey, and uh, we drove up the, the gravel road to the village and it's an 11 mile road and it took 45 minutes because you switch this way and that way and that way and that way about 10 times as you climb the thousand miles, thousand feet that goes up, um, up the side of the mountain. And then when the, when the bus arrives at Holden, you're greeted by a lot of friendly staff and guests who are there to meet you and make you feel really welcome. So I was there with a group of volunteers uh, who were there to help this village get ready for winter. They, um, they're at about 3,200 feet, and they get about 300 inches of snow every year. And so it takes some work to, um, they, they close up some of the buildings so that they don't have to heat them. They um, really kind of hunker down for the, for the winter, and so I was there to help them do that with a group of other people. And uh, so my days were mostly filled with work in this, uh, in this holy place. I, I organized all of the um, bowling shoes for the, the really sweet little four-lane bowling alley that they have if you bowl at Holden. Your team has to have at least one person who's willing to go stand in the pit and re-rack the pins. And you have to have somebody who knows how to keep score. Uh, I helped inventory camping equipment. I set up 13 tents or 15 tents or something like that to make sure they all had poles and stakes and such. Um, 
We sorted through hundreds of games and puzzles to make sure that they all had their parts um, so that they were ready for the summer guests to come back and for winter guests to, to use during the long nights. Um, I sewed up storage sacks for the sleeping bags that they loan out to people, and I deep cleaned the wall of tea in uh, the dining hall. I spent many minutes um, sorting, uh, drinking tea from, from the Holden Village wall of tea. But I also sat on the porch of my cabin and watched the light change on the mountains. When I got there, there was snow on the top of the peaks. By the end of the week, there wasn't. I went stargazing with the village naturalist. I made art, and I worshipped with the community. Well, there's some hiking that I did. Um, and I worshipped with the community at the evening Vesper service every night. It was definitely a sacred place. And what I think makes New Komoldali and Holden Village sacred places, at least to me, are some of the things that we talked about already. They are both places of natural beauty, uh, where I feel close to God because I am so close to God's creation. They are places where community is strong, where I felt authentically welcomed into that community. And they're places that have a regular and meaningful practice of prayer and worship, where the presence of God is invoked and expected. But the more I thought about these places, the more I realized that there was something else that they had in common that's something that kind of feels paradoxical. Because both at New Camaldoli and at Holden, there are people who live there year-round, not just people who come and visit and experience the holy ground. They are people who are living their ordinary lives in these spaces. So the monks and the village staff cook meals and they do dishes, and they scrub floors, and they vacuum, and they clean toilets, and they work, and they do laundry, and they study, and they goof off, just like we do every single day. So how are these places both sacred and ordinary, and how is it possible for us to begin to create sacred space even in our ordinary lives, wherever it is that we are? In our scripture reading from the Hebrew Bible, we heard the story of Jacob and his encounter with a sacred place. Jacob is not out looking for sacred space. He is actually on the run, um, trying to get away from his brother Esau. He has just cheated Esau out of his Esau's birthright and father's blessing as the elder son. And since Esau probably would have killed Jacob for his deception, Jacob hightails it out of his home, and he heads across the desert to seek refuge with his uncle Laban. And in the part of the story that we read, he's out in the middle of nowhere, in a desolate place, alone. Maybe he's afraid. He's worried about his future. And then he has a dream. The dream of a ladder dropped from heaven with angels going up and down. And when he wakes up, he realizes that God is present right there in the desolate wilderness. Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it, he says. How awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. The wilderness was the same wilderness as it was the night before. It was the same rocks and the same sand. But something has shifted. Jacob essentially wakes up to the realization that God is always present wherever we are. And what we need to do to create holy ground is to pay attention. If we are awake enough to see it, God can drop a ladder anywhere, at any time. And really, the Bible is full of similar stories encountering God in all sorts of places. In her book, An Altar in the World, Episcopal priest and religious studies professor Barbara Brown Taylor puts it this way, People encounter God under shady oak trees, on riverbanks, at the tops of mountains, and in long stretches of barren wilderness. God shows up in whirlwinds, in starry skies, burning bushes, and perfect strangers. When people want to know more about God, the Son of God tells them to pay attention 
to the lilies of the field and the birds of the air, to women needing bread and workers lining up for their pay. God is not out there in the spiritual realm, but right here in our daily lives. And we are just as able to feel the presence of God when we're doing some ordinary task as when we are sitting in worship. Unfortunately, we're usually too busy to notice. And when we do notice, there are plenty of ways to make that presence go away. Like figuring we've just had a little too much caffeine and for the day, and turning back to our to-do list. Author and scholar Rabbi Lawrence Kushner describes Jacob's experience this way. The beginning of knowing about God is simply paying attention, being fully present where you are. God, the Holy One of being, is more than everywhere. God is the bosom in which creation happens day after day ground and the source of everything that exists, the very place of being itself. And to be awake and present in this place is to encounter God. So what is different about the folks who live at New Camoldoli and Holden, perhaps, is that they have become practiced in noticing the presence of God in their everyday lives. By choosing to live in deliberate spiritual communities, they have set the intention to notice God's presence and to be aware of the ladders dropping from heaven. And perhaps the lesson for us is that we, too, can be more intentional about noticing the sacred in the ordinary flow of our lives, like Jacob waking up to the presence of God in And this was the lesson of my second experience of holy ground. The second place I went to was a pilgrimage that I took along the Oregon coast. This is um, a shipwreck that just kind of appeared one day after a storm on the Oregon coast. Along with 13 others that I had never met before, I walked from Fort Stevens State Park just south of the Columbia River along the wide and windy beaches, over Tillamook Head to Arch Cape, passing through the towns of Seaside and Cannon Beach with its iconic Haystack Rock and other rocky monuments. Uh, We had some beautiful, whoops, I flip-flopped that. We had some really dramatic skies with some powerful rain. That is a rainbow right in the middle. And one of my companions is standing on the edge of the ocean there. We also had some really beautiful, windy, sunny days. And we had some relentless drizzle and sloppy trails. I'm not wearing glasses because there was just no point. Um, I wouldn't have been able to see with them on. Uh, I'm the third from the right in the front row in the blue. Uh, My fitness tracker, that's from the first day. 41,000 steps, 16.98 miles. My fitness tracker says that I walked 45 miles in three days. I don't know how accurate they are, but it felt like 45 miles. It was really hard, (laughs) and it was really amazing. It was really amazing. Most traditional pilgrimages take the traveler on a journey to a specific place, to a a, a specific holy spot, the Grotto of Lourdes, the town of Assisi, uh, Chartres Cathedral, Mecca, Jerusalem. But this pilgrimage had no specific sacred place as a destination, and instead... The journey was the point. The journey was the sacred place. And our intention became to create our own mobile spiritual community, experiencing all the landscape we moved through as holy ground and being open to the divine presence in every moment. And what was really remarkable about this journey was that the 14 of us most of 11 of whom had never met before. We had three leaders, 11 strangers. Um, We 
became spiritual community for each other in hours and supported each other on our on our trip in a very remarkable way that I have not experienced with strangers before. In fact, one of us was a was a nun. Um, she had lived in spiritual community all of her adult life, and she said that it for a person who lives in intentional spiritual community, she said this was the most remarkable, quickest achieving of spiritual community that she had ever experienced. There were two moments in particular that were evidence of this. As we climbed up on, over Tillamook Head, we encountered this huge fallen tree. That's the root system of a giant tree that fell probably decades ago. It just made this wall of roots that towered over our heads. And as we approached it, and we were kind of strung out along the trail, so it, we kind of approached in little groups. But as we got there, we just got really quiet. And we approached this wall of roots with great reverence, kind of pausing to observe the little tiny life forms that were clinging to the roots. And we all felt that we were on holy ground without actually saying, this is a holy place. We just really felt it without any of us announcing it. And then the second moment came as we ended the journey together. We got to the point at which we were going to stop. And um, when we reached that end point, we drew a labyrinth on the sand. And then we walked it together, creating our own sacred space in the midst of this ordinary windy beach with other people kind of looking at us. Wondering what we were doing. But like Jacob, we woke up to the presence of God, saying, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Still, despite this profound experience, the question remains for me, how do I create that sense of being in God's presence in every moment, even in the quotidian, the, the ordinary, the maybe even boring moments of each day. And I don't necessarily have the answer, but I have begun to pay more attention. And there are two practices that help me. After being so soaked in the glory of God's creation for many days during my sabbatical, I know that I must get out into nature in order to feel right side up and connected to God. And these last days of unhealthy air have been miserable for me. I know they're miserable for all of us because it's so hard to breathe, but it's also prevented me from being outside and going hiking and being in God's creation. And I feel that lack almost viscerally in my body. And then the second practice is a practice of daily prayer. During my sabbatical, I established a, a practice of regular two to three times daily prayer. Um, and you'll probably hear more about this in the coming weeks. And I know, and now I know that I don't feel connected and present, and I don't quite feel right. I don't feel ready to notice God in the everyday when I neglect my prayers, especially if I am in a rush in the morning and I don't do my morning prayer. I know that I can't always live in that intense, profound way that my pilgrimage group did for those three or four days together. But I know that through deliberate practice and, and deliberately paying attention, I can start to come closer and I can be awake to God's ladders dropping from heaven more frequently. Because I do know that God is present in every moment and in every place in our lives, not just in those separate holy and sacred places that we hold dear. And my friends, this is the good news. My prayer for us is that we will become pilgrims together, helping each other to wake up to that presence and to support each other on the journey through the sacred ordinance.